February 14 marks the anniversary of the Bahraini Revolution. This was one of the first revolutions of the Persian Gulf Arab countries, which is still evolving until today. From the harsh crackdowns to kangaroo courts to torture and mass arrest, the regime has crushed any form of opposition. So why does the revolution continue? Why doesn't it lead to the removal of the ruling Al Khalifa regime? In this edition of the Spotlight, we will look at the Bahraini Revolution and see whether the opposition has any chance of taking this revolution to the next level. First, let me introduce our guests for this edition of the program. Gina Rabai joins us. She's a researcher from the Bahrain Forum for Human Rights, who joins us from Beirut. Also joining us is Tony Gosling, investigative journalist from Bristol. Welcome to you both. Uh, Gina Rabai, let me first start with you and uh, ask you if you recall uh, the day, February 14th, we saw protests to have erupted in Bahrain, which had erupted before, but not in the scale that it did back then. Of course, this is going back a number of years now, 2011. And it was one of the first to actually break out in the Arab world uh, at that point. Uh, why do you think uh, it, it came about in the way that they did, uh, in the numbers that they did back then? Um, and of course, you know, they, they obviously felt uh, not only were they marginalized, but they weren't part of the political system. Uh, good evening to you and to all uh, the people who are watching us now. Uh, the beginning of the Bahrain revolution was part of what was called then the Arab Spring. But the people of Bahrain were, uh, distinguished themselves from, the, from other peoples of the Arab Spring in that they did not demand the overthrow of the regime, but rather demanded reforms and demanded civil, political, and welfare rights because that is what they lacked. The opposition leadership called for dialogue with the authority in order to reach a consensus that satisfies all. So the presence of the Al Khalifa dynasty in power was not under threat, but rather it was actually an, a golden opportunity for the Al Khalifa dynasty to gain popular legitimacy, even though they are an unelected dictatorial authority. However, they faced the demands with peaceful, uh, they, they faced the, the peaceful demands and, pro and uh, demonstrations with repression and killing and by summoning the Peninsula Shield forces from Saudi Arabia to support the Bahraini authorities by committing massacres against the peaceful protesters. Uh, today the revolution continues. The people still lack what they, what they didn't get and actually their demands are even more. They're now de they're demanding the uh, unconditional and immediate release of prisoners of conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, the people insist on their demands because they realize that by retreating or submitting, the situation will not return to the way it was before the start of the revolution on February 14, 2011, but it will become worse and the Al Khalifa behavior will become more vengeful and, sure. uh, vengeful and brutal because they clearly express grudges towards everyone who, do, who objects to, the, to their policies. Right. The people of Bahrain express their will to continue through their protests and that they are ready to make more sacrifices until their goals are achieved. Okay. Some of these protests are held, are held on on a daily basis. We as human rights organizations, we monitor them daily and they're still going on. Okay, well uh, th that's uh, what we're trying to figure out here, Tony Gosling, in terms of the way that the um, Al Khalifa regime has dealt with uh, not just the protests but the Bahrainis from that point until now because uh, uh, we're looking at uh, for example how they still banned the media doesn't operate there since 2017 um, unless uh, it's in one form or another that's for any particular for example events like the uh, I guess uh, the racing uh, uh, events uh, it's the F-15 I forget what it's called or if you have uh, for example opposition that have been dissolved I mean, it just makes it look like they have something to hide. They don't want any of this opposition to, to leak out. Uh, they've arrested prosecuted, they've harassed, uh, obviously, uh, the human rights defenders, journalists, et cetera. Uh, what, what is the deal with them? Why are they trying so hard? It's been uh, so long. If they put all that time into doing something about it, perhaps at this point something might have come out of it. Well, look, you're quite right. Say so they've got something to hide, but they're not the only... Gulf state with something to hide. A little of these uh, countries are now normalizing relationships with Israel. 
if you can believe that, even though they're ma majority Arab countries. You know, what is going on? Something completely surreal, almost absurd. Obviously, it's not absurd for those. And I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there was no revolution. Obviously, there is uh, you know, a movement against uh, the government for the repressive authoritarian regime. Human Rights Watch uh, is talking about their human rights record as dismal. Uh, torture is normal. Uh, demonstrators, human rights demonstrators are executed in, in Bahrain. Um, and of course, it was part of the 2011 Arab Spring. Um, this is the same in many, many countries where this Arab Spring took place. In fact, in Egypt, probably one of the worst was where the Muslim Brotherhood came to power. Uh, and what happened? The Americans intervened with um, the, yeah, the US, basically the Pentagon and the US deep state intervened there uh, and then just toppled the government. And most of the people who've been involved in the revolution, in it, as many saw it at the time in Egypt, were jailed and executed. So these were, in a way, a kind of trick by the United States uh, in order to spark a revolution and then to identify uh, the competition with the established order. What do you mean tricked uh, by the US to start or spark a revolution? I'm not too sure I follow that. Can you explain that a little well, further? What I'm saying is, I think, no, I think the Arab Springs were, uh, and there is evidence that there was, uh, a, although, of course, there's a genuine movement out there. That, that some of that was triggered deliberately uh, by elements in the West who wanted to flush out the opposition in these countries. Look, uh, Bahrain is a tiny place. It's basically uh, was used for pearl diving, and it was the British Empire that created this n nightmare we have now by creating what they wanted was the, a port, uh, a, an independent state, a port. In the 1970s, as the British Empire was collapsing, 1971. Uh, you've got around about 1.5 million population, half of which are migrant workers uh, there. Uh, and in 1973, in two years, they had to suspend the constitution. This has been basically a, a set up by the British, an authoritarian puppet state, which is now doing pretty much exactly what the Western world wants. Uh, okay. and, and that is proved proved with this normalization with Israel, which is an apartheid state, as Desmond Tutu in South Africa said before he died, bless him, he, he's pointed out that this Israeli state is more apartheid even than South Africa was, more racist against the Palestinians because it wants to wipe the Palestinians out. Now, how can any Arab country in its normal mind uh, be normalized relations with, with Israel? It's impossible. Well, uh, you, you talked about a few different uh, issues or topics there. Um, uh, you know, let me ask you about first the so-called normalization that Bahrain uh, was um, so keen to do after the UAE. I mean, pretty much within a month, he came it came out and uh, re-established ties. No, I mean, established ties. Well, I said re-established is a slip of the tongue because we know behind the scenes, Israel does have a relationship with these uh, uh, Persian Gulf Arab countries and, and their monarchies. Um, one of the angles behind this normalization is said that Bahrain wanted to make sure that it's in the uh, U.S.'s, uh, so to speak, uh, good hands or a, a positive outlook from the White House on Bahrain in order to make sure that uh, the U.S. somewhat overlooks the human rights uh, violations that are taking place on the island. But uh, here we are two years later. What did the Bahrain gain from this uh, so-called normalization? What did it do for it? Nothing. Uh, no, this will be for, uh, I'm sorry, for Gina Rabay. I'll come to you with that question, Tony Galsin. Go ahead, Gina um, Rabei. Okay, so to speak about the base of the problem. In Bahrain, there is a minority that rules the majority. What does this minority base on in order to be able to impose itself on the majority of the people? It is based solely on its alliances with strong countries, specifically USA and Britain. And now Israel. Israel is not as strong as before, but Bahrain would do anything uh, for the USA just to stay. Al Khalifa would do anything just to stay in power. They receive support from them, and not only their si the silence uh, for on, the, on their crimes. Here, I want to point out something that Sheikh Isa Qasim said today, the leader of the of the Bahraini opposition. He spoke about the the Bahraini authorities fight fight against religion. We, as human rights organization, we do monitor that. But he said their fight against religion is unjustified because the authorities does not need it to maintain their rule. He said that this fight against religion is an external condition for their staying in power. Yes, 
To this extent, the Bahraini authorities would, would obey the dictates of an, of an external, ally, uh, of its external allies because the basis of its very presence in power is based on its alliances with these countries. So yes, it would normalize, it would, it would do anything when just you, so when that... When you talk about religion, religion from uh, uh, Sheikh Issa Ghassam, are you talking about how uh, he is uh, saying that they are uh, somewhat uh, differentiating then between the Shias and the Sunnis? Because that's not, no, what, no. Uh, that's not what really, for example, Iran doesn't look at it that way. Uh, Iran as a third party. Uh, on looking at this whole situation. I, I'm just wondering what you mean by the, the religion aspect there. No, he clearly said today that there is a fight against religion. It's not a fight against a sect or just slander, make, uh, creating slander between sects in Bahrain. There is a fight against Islam, as he said. Uh -huh. And he said they don't need it. Actually, we do monitor that. They do, they, they uh, broke mosques. And they uh, daily in prisons, they deprive uh, Muslim uh, prisoners sometimes from praying. It happens a lot. Yes. So he said they don't need it. Why do they do it? And he says it is an, exter an external uh, dictation just for, as a condition to stay in power. Yes. And we, we do see that clear uh, because we do monitor it. What are so they so afraid of by doing is, that, though? When you say that, obviously they feel like uh, they can re relinquish the importance that the majority have uh, in terms of, uh, for example, the Shias. And I'm not trying to turn this into a Shia or a Sunni thing. I'm just curious about that because they are obviously afraid uh, by making that type of a, or having that type of approach towards the rest of the Bahraini population, right? Well, it happens that the majority are Shia, so they are afraid that uh, the Shia would take over the rule. But you know what? From the beginning, the opposition, with, in all its sects and it's all its, its ideologies, political ideologies, some of them are um, not religious-based, they're only asking for, uh, uh, um, dem uh, demanding for, um, uh, I forgot, the, sorry, I forgot the, word, the term in English, uh, reforms, reforms and civil rights and, and uh, welfare rights. Right. Today... Uh, despite all the crimes, despite all the crimes committed by, Bahraini, by the Bahraini authorities and despite the presence of the political opposition leaders in prison and abroad, and despite the presence of more than 2,000 prisoners of conscience in prisons, uh, the popular opposition forces are still calling on the authority to dialogue. The Deputy Secretary um, General of the Al-Wifaq National Islamic Society called on dialogue just today. They still called call for dialogue because they still, uh, they still, yeah, uh, they reflect their seriousness in the demands that they always called on. Okay. Uh, that they let only me, want, let me direct uh, that, th let me direct that angle of what you said to our guest, Tony Gusling. C a call for dialogue. It sounds simple enough. Why doesn't the U.S. make that call? Why doesn't the U.K. make a call for the uh, ruling family to have dialogue with the opposition, which, well, they have disbanded, but I mean, uh, there's, that sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. But the godless West, uh, although it sometimes talks about Christianity, of course, it's just like the Knights Templar and the Crusades has got nothing to do with real Christianity. Uh, they look at you, what's been going on in Ukraine, too. There is no wish to dialogue. Uh, the idea is war, I'm afraid, because war makes a lot of money and war can grab resources. Uh, so, I mean, there's, by the way, really important to stress when you're talking about Bahrain, any of your viewers that want to look into what happened there, and I mean, it's a horrific story what the regime did in the Arab Spring. Um, your competition, Al Jazeera, did a documentary shouting in the dark, I remember watching, which is absolutely shocking to see how a government can treat its people. A government is supposed to really be a servant of its people. This government is not. It is afraid of its people. Uh, and actually, uh, it's when I talk about the godless West, this is just another puppet regime of the West, just like uh, Zelensky in Ukraine. Puppets, these people, are not sovereign countries whatsoever. Uh, and actually, they're puppets of a, an organisation called CENTCOM. CENTCOM is, uh, it dominates the Middle East and it is a US military office, uh, part of the uh, American military plans to dominate the world. They have these offices for all parts of the world. They're that arrogant. Uh, and actually, of course, the, United, the EU and the UK are also part of this, you know, this coalition, which is attempting war. Now, the reason why is because they are having an international push right now uh, for a world government. And they want that war to 
cause so much chaos that they can say, well, come on, we all need to get together and sort this out. But they want to dominate the outcome. And that's how crazy they are. They're okay. not interested in a multi multipolar world with different countries having different cultures, different points of view. They're trying to force the issue by forcing a world war. And Bahrain is just one more puppet on that string. Well, you have uh, the uh, UK, uh, US's fifth fleet that's stationed there. Um, Again, yeah, Rabbi, you have uh, the, the UK that uh, established a military base in the year 2018, which is said was to strengthen its presence in West Asia. Uh, of course, when you uh, have these two um, countries that are supposedly the flag bearers of democracy, right under their nose, as you mentioned, 2,000 uh, prisoners of conscience, torture, abuses, etc., uh, puts into question uh, why they are overlooking that. But is the bigger question uh, right across that bridge by the name of uh, Saudi Arabia, which is why the U.S. Uh, wanted to prevent this revolution from progressing at the rate that it was, because it was right at the back door of Saudi Arabia, and it couldn't afford for the kingdom to uh, pretty much have its population rise against it. Do you agree with that? It could be. I don't have facts about that, but yes, it could be like that. Um, uh, anyway, today the Bahrain people are given a second chance to their to their lead to the uh, to the government, to the Al Khalifa dynasty. But it does. But there is no loom that that the authorities will respond to the peaceful dem demands. But about the political reasons behind what why the U.S. is doing that, or, or we really don't know. But we do know for a fact that the U.S.A. and Britain can simply order. The Bahrain, uh, the Bahrain authorities not to repress its people and the, bah the Bahrain authority authorities will be more than happy to comply because it is the orders of its masters. They just don't because they don't care about the Bahraini people and because maybe, as you say, it is for their benefit that the Bahraini people are being repressed. Uh, the way that the opposition has been uh, crushed is really, uh, in a sense, uh, to use a, another, uh, I can't use another word or think of another word right now, but farcical, Tony Gosling, when you take a look at the 2022 elections. Uh, I don't know if you recall, they held the elections, but there were no opposition candidates. <laughs> so they came out and they raved about the fact that there was such a turnout. You had so many people that came out, but they had banned the opposition candidates from this. I mean, that's whitewashing the whole thing. Uh, basically, you had the two obviously main opposition groups who were banned from this. Uh, again, it puts into question this notion of democracy that it seems like it's important for them to display to the world. So people get an idea that there is maybe some notion of that, but clearly there's not. Well, look, it's an insult to the intelligence of Bahrainis, and it's an insult to the intelligence of every human being on planet Earth. This is a sham democracy. It's basically a puppet show, a stage show, and the idea that we all believe everything that we see on the Western television. I'm afraid it, this is one of, one of my colleagues for the stupid people. The idea is that nobody actually understands what's really going on, except the people maybe in Bahrain itself. Uh, and this is, of course, it falls at the feet of the Western press. The Western press is dominated. I used to work for the BBC myself, and I can tell you, it's now become just a propaganda machine. The sort of thing when I was growing up, we were told went on in the Soviet Union. The idea that, you know, you've got a command economy and a one-party state. Effectively, you've got exactly the same in Bahrain, a one-party state and democracy is a sham. But this will come to a head, and when... Uh, the rubber hits the road, as they say. I'm quite certain that the Bahraini people will get what they want, but it may not be for a while yet, and there may well be much, much greater conflagration. Of course, the Middle East, the big focus for the West point of view, still is the oil supplies. And I wonder, and I think this, I think the case is that the reason the West is going very anti-oil is because they know there's going to be a war, and they know that that war, that, that war will threaten their supply of oil. So that's why they're going bananas right now about electric cars and things like that. They're trying to stop oil uh, because they know a war is coming. And I, I don't like to be the harbinger of bad news, but um, as far as I can see, both uh, in Central Europe and Eastern Europe and in uh, the Middle East, uh, the forces of darkness are really trying to push and that's why they're not discussing, that's not why they're not debating. Uh, but I wonder whether many of these uh, caliphates and uh -huh. the people who are running the Gulf states realize what's going on. I'd like to warn them, watch out, do not trust the USA, do not trust your Western backers. Sure. Well, uh, and don't trust Israel. 
I think that's another thing that, um, again, over by we can t we can uh, discuss a little bit more. In my question to you, and there was a, a, a really uh, somewhat shocking act that occurred between Israel and uh, the Persian Gulf island of Bahrain, where Israel bought an island there. I think it was to the tune of uh, 150 million dollars, where you had uh, the daughter of one of uh, one of the activists. Uh, come out with a tweet that said uh, that's best described as colonial expansion from a ruling, foreign ruling family that occupied Bahrain violently and has been ruling it violently. How dangerous is the Israeli factor in this, uh, do you think? The Bahraini authorities deal with Bahrain as if it's their property. I mentioned that earlier. This is definitely very much dangerous because they are selling land, they all, they not, not just this island, they are selling uh, other land uh, in the in the mainland of Bahrain, it's all, it's all an island, a big island, but they they are selling land. It's as if they're turning it to a second Palestine. In some protests, people actually held banners that said, "We don't want to become a second Palestine because they're turning it in, in, into like a Jew." Uh, they say it's Jude, like a Judaism um, uh, ob uh, a project or something like that. Um, as I agree totally with your other guest. When he spoke about the the uh, that the, the, the Bahraini authorities should be aware of, of their future because the USA has no future in in, in being the the solely pole in the world anymore. Uh, today, the Bahraini authorities can still go back, can still and yeah, take uh, go back in their steps, can still take their opportunity that is still given by the opposition, and I I really don't see that they will do, but we can just hope. About the elections, I would like to, to say, please, I would like to comment. Quickly. That this is the third consecutive election that happened this way. Opposition leaders who used to represent more than 60% of voters are now in prison and are not al allowed to, to, be, to be elected anymore. That's how sham okay. it is, and nobody cares in the whole world. Thank you very much. We're going to end it there again, everybody. We appreciate it. Researcher. Uh, Bahrain Forum for Human Rights from Beirut. Tony Gosling, investigative journalist from Bristol. Thank you to you both. With that, we come to an end for this edition of the Spotlight from Yikabe Tahweh and the team. It's goodbye.